Today, we're going to be having our third conversation with Yaron Brook, who is the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute and host of the Yaron Brook Show. This is number three in a series of discussions produced in partnership with the Ayn Rand Institute. We've talked about Ayn Rand and objectivism. We've talked about uh, capitalism and other economic systems. And today we're going to talk a little bit about welfare programs. We will also talk about universal basic income. So maybe for this one, you're on, maybe I'll lay out my view first and then give you a, a chance to to respond to that. Sure. Sounds okay. good. So my view on welfare programs in general, and I think we'll start general and then maybe get more specific is number one. I don't see any moral case against welfare programs in principle. For me, one of the beautiful things about humans getting beyond a state of nature into an era of governments and technology and education and advancement is that we have the political and economic resources to set some floor for the circumstances in which people uh, will live. I don't subscribe to what George Lakoff calls strict father morality, where I'm motivated by the idea of teaching people a lesson by not helping them when we can in principle. I think that uh, there, there's little about uh, that that I find convincing that the people will be better off in some long run if no one helps them and they either die or figure it out or don't or whatever. I don't buy that. I do believe that once you sort of put aside principles that might be appealing to a 16 year old hearing about libertarian ideas for the first time and think about the real world and people and relationships, I think that there are many positive elements of establishing a welfare system. Now, any welfare system or insurance system has some free riders. There will be some people who will overuse the benefits, people who will be motivated not really to use these benefits as a bridge to better their circumstances, but they want to hang around and collect 200 bucks in food stamps or whatever. I don't think policy should be made around them. Uh, and I think that in total, if you have a properly run program, be it food stamps or unemployment or whatever, I believe economically it's a net stimulus. And I think that when you consider the positive externalities, um, we're doing something good. And I'll give a couple examples and then turn it over to you. You hear stories about people sitting back and collecting welfare and being thrilled to live on the government dole. I don't think anybody's riding high on food stamps and unemployment. If you want to talk about corporate welfare, then maybe we have something to talk about. But I don't think that's that's today's subject. Um, the small percentage of people who do find themselves satisfied by what they can make from welfare programs, I'm just not worried about them. I think most people want to do things. Most people want to be productive. You know, the non-existent welfare queen with a Cadillac from the Reagan era never, never existed. And we know that if people can't afford food, they'll commit crimes to get food. This taxes our police departments, our uh, emotions. We feel unsafe in our neighborhoods. We don't go out. So my starting point is everybody uh, it's society overall benefits in the short and medium term from properly calibrated, thoughtful welfare programs. And in the long run, the sun expands and engulfs the earth. So I'm not super worried about the extreme long run. That's my framework for thinking about this. Sure. And it's it's the framework on which we are going to disagree because I'm going to I'm going to defend the 16 year old. I guess I never grew out of of, of <laughs> still am that person. And I'm I'm going to you know, I reject them, the welfare state, not because of the free riders, not because of the welfare catalog, whatever. I, I you know, I, I don't really care about those things. I don't think that's the essential. I don't think it's important whether they exist or not. I think the welfare state is fundamentally and deeply immoral. And it's immoral because it basically negates the rights of individuals to do as they will with the wealth that they have, that they have created. It is somebody else, the government in this case, deciding what is best use for my resources based on some standard of social well-being, which I reject, which I reject as, as being an even standard. The role of government, as we discussed last time, in my view, is to protect the rights of individuals to be free, to act freely, to think freely, it, which means to invest freely, to consume freely, to give away their money freely, to do whatever they want with their time, their resources, and their mind. And the state here comes and tells me that they have decided that there is a group over there that needs my help. Now, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but they have decided that I should help them. And they're not asking me for help. They're not requesting me to help. 
they are coercing me. They're forcing me. They're putting a gun to my head and forcing me to help that group. I reject violence. I reject coercion. I reject force. I mean, if you had said, I think there are people who need help and I'd like to see a society in which there are voluntary organizations that help people that need help, then, you know, that's a fruitful conversation to have. But as soon as you bring in the element of, I know what's good. I know what's good for society. I know who needs help and how much help and where they need help and what programs to help them. And I'm going to force you to participate. I think now it's an immoral system and it's a violation of the very principle on which government was established or should have been established, which is the principle of protecting individual rights, not violating them. Now, I do want to say something about welfare recipients, because I I do think I I, and I I want to say something about the economics of it, too. But I do think that. it's also harmful psychologically in this and, and, and from a self-esteem perspective, and from a moral perspective, for people to be on welfare, particularly given that I don't think the state particularly does charity very well. I think that, uh, you know, put aside the borderline cases, but I think that a lot of people who feel like or, or, or are institutionalized into, into, into a welfare where they expect it and it becomes an entitlement, and it becomes a way of life. And I think that is horrible for them. I think it's sad for them. I think it's, 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 I think the one thing about charity is it functions in a way that is usually much more, much more restricted, much more time bound, and usually encourages people to rise up from their state and take control of their own lives. I think what welfare does to most poor people is it makes them dependent and that destroys their self-esteem. Basically, the state is coming to people and saying, eh, you guys can't take care of yourself, whether it's because of your culture, whether it's because of your IQ, or whether it's because of your mentality, whatever it is, you can't take care of yourself. You need our help and we're gonna help you and don't worry, we're gonna help you. And, and yes, it's not help enough to be middle class, but it's basically institutionalizing people into poverty and giving them all the wrong messages and there's no accident that the war in poverty has done very little to reduce poverty. One last point, because you raised a lot of issues. It's not a net stimulus. I mean, we really get, need to get rid of this bogus economic idea that consumption drives the economy. I mean, it drives me nuts because everybody repeats it as if this is gonna, this is gonna, it's the case. What you're doing is you're basically taking saving and investment and turning it into consumption. Any decent economist, half honest economist will tell you that what you're doing is, yes, you're, you're sacrificing long-term economic growth. You're sacrificing long-term economic prosperity for short-term, uh, for short-term economic growth that's fleeting. Consumption, by its nature, is destruction. When you eat something, it's gone. It goes away. That's the nature of consumption. Investment is what builds things for the future. Investment and savings are what create economic growth for the future. Wealthy people who you're taxing, or even middle-class people who you're taxing, uh, don't consume their money. They, they invest it and save it. And it's that investment and saving that you're taking and you're turning it into, so it's net for the economy, negative. There's no positive stimulus. I hear Andrew Yang talk about this and I hear lots of economists from particular persuasion talk about this. This is just not true. It's not economically sound. I don't think Keynes would agree with this. Uh, it, you know, so I, I think we got, need to get the economics right on top of everything. I, well, I think we do. And I, I do think you're you're completely misstating the economics. But let's maybe come back to that, because there were some things you said earlier that I want to focus on. One, one thing is, you know, I think it's very presumptuous of you to say that the psychological impact of receiving a benefit from a welfare program is that you feel bad about yourself and unworthy and all these things. But that if you get the same from charity, people feel great. I I think that that is a a distinction that makes no sense whatsoever. I don't even know that it really should have much of a part in our discussion because you can feel okay or not okay if the money comes from from government or charity. I don't think it makes a big difference. It's a huge difference. The one comes from government. It's a it's 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 you know, you know that it's it's money that's being coerced from other people. No, most people don't agree with that framing. So I would just most people don't see taxes. Hold on. But you're on. You're on. Hold on. If but most people, but hold on a second. If most people don't see taxes as coercion, how can you say most people see the welfare benefits as having been coerced? Of course, everybody knows taxes are coercion, whether you want to admit it or not. Ta- I mean, try not paying your taxes. Taxes are not voluntary. You can't turn something that is forced upon you, whether you like it or not, 
into something that's somehow voluntary. It's hold not on a second. But hold, let's explore that a little bit. You're yeah. on. You, you, for the benefit of the audience, you're originally from Israel. Is that right? That's right. Okay. I'm, I'm originally from Argentina. So at a certain point, uh, did you come to the U S with your parents or by yourself? I don't know exactly, but it's not hugely relevant, but just so I get the, the analogy, correct. Came by myself. Okay. At a certain point, you made the decision to come to the United States. And when you did that, were you ignorant to the fact that there were taxes here? No, but that doesn't change the fact. Let me, let me make this point. If somebody, if somebody emigrates, if a Jew emigrates into Germany, when they're concentration camps, is it his fault that he gets sent to the immigrant? I mean, it's a stupid thing to do. But the fact is the evil of killing people, the evil of taxing people, of using coercion against people is not diminished by the fact that I know it's going to happen to me when I come. But it's the a little bit different. You're hold on. I don't I, I can't imagine you're equating concentration camps to taxes. I'm equating coercion. Co coercion is coercion. Now, true, it's a much greater evil, much greater evil to kill people than it is to take their wealth. OK, but, but it, both are evil. fine, both are evil. And let, let me just say this as well. Look, it, it's not like I have any options, right? Every state in the world today coerces people. Well, uh, it, but then that's so, so. But I think we allow me to at least follow it fully through. So you you did ch you, you concede you chose to come to the US knowing what the system was, but you say that doesn't make the system any more moral. Fine, I, I concede that it doesn't. But then to suggest that choosing to come to the U.S. knowing the tax system, choosing to stay in the United States and work and then saying that you were completely coerced into paying American taxes. That seems like a bit of a stretch. Now you're getting to one of the most important elements here, which is. But hold on, David. Other countries also have taxes. That's right. And there's a reason why, which is once you have more than a couple hundred people who want to live together, uh, as Jared Diamond has written about brilliantly in his book, you need to delegate some decision making power. And that's what we call government. But you're, you're sort of getting to making my case for me. No, I mean, you need to delegate some decision making to government. But if government is then and the purpose of that is to eliminate coercion, if government is then using coercion in order to so-called eliminate coercion, and it's not it's just to increase coercion, it's it's violating the very principle in which it was put together. And therefore it is it. it, it undermines its own legitimacy. But look, you know, you, there are lots of situations in life where you can imagine where coercion exists and you can't get out of it. You know, you, you have a little storefront in the east side of New York in the early 20th century and the mafia comes around and collects protection. And and, you know, you would you say it's voluntary that you give them the protection money? Well, of course, it's not voluntary. You be coerced. You know the consequences if you don't pay the coercion. So people say, well, why don't you leave the store and go somewhere else? Well, because it's expensive to leave the store. It's difficult to leave the store. And there might be protection money you have to pay in the next neighborhood as well. So I pay the protection. But you know what? I'm still going to complain about it. I still view it as immoral that I'm paying the protection money because it's unjust. It's not right. It's not fair. And I view what the government does for takes money from me and give it to somebody else is the equivalent of protection. money. Yes. In a sense, they're coming to me and say, you cannot pay and you go to jail. You cannot pay and I'll break your window, burn down your store. It's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same form of force. Now, you you need to just admit this and say you're OK with some coercion. That is what most people say is, look, when we come together in a society, we we accept that there's going to be some coercion placed on some people and we're OK with that. I'm not. And I think it's wrong. And I think it's OK. Morally, it's morally offensive because I think, again, my view is the individual coercion against the individual is always going to be morally wrong. Right? Coercion. So the initiation of force against an individual is always morally wrong. And within that framework, Government cannot tax to regulate. Government cannot tax to redistribute wealth. Government cannot use coercive taxation. But so the, the problem I'm having is you, you've conceded that there is a voluntary nature to your choice to come to the United States, knowing the taxation system and to stay here and to work here. And I get it. If you do it and then you don't pay the taxes, eventually someone with a gun will come and bring you to jail. But you still chose to come to the U.S. knowing there are taxes and to work. Now you're saying I still get to complain about it. And you do. And I completely respect and su support your, your desire and ability to complain about it. But, to way, then, but hold on, hold on. Yep. But to then take a decision that you concede was a voluntary one, even if you don't like it, 
and say that the entire system is coercive versus saying we live in societies and understand that we are giving up the ability to decide everything that happens in the society because that's how a society works. It's a very it's a game that is partially linguistic and part ideological that's being played. It's definitely ideological. I'm not against ideology. I'm a big supporter of ideology. I have an ideology. Sure. And 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 I think my ideology is logically consistent. But no, I, I think what you're saying is completely, you know, illegitimate and, 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 and not logical. The fact that I chose a less of two evils, I could have stayed in Israel. I considered that a greater evil tax. Let's just take taxes. Taxes were higher. I chose a less of two evils doesn't make the lesser evil less evil. It's still evil. Right now, it might be less evil than Israel, but it's still evil. And, and, and I will do everything I can to reduce that evil further. And you would do the same thing. Let's say you believe you came here from Argentina. Or let's yes. say let's say let's say you didn't come from Argentina. Let's say you came here from Denmark. You didn't come from Denmark. But I know people who've come to the United States from Denmark. OK. And, and you and, and you have a particular point of view, a, a pro welfare state point of view. And you say, you know, I don't think the United States is more because it doesn't redistribute enough. And people would say, well, why don't you stay in Denmark? Denmark, they redistribute more. And you would say that's an illegitimate argument. It's OK to come to the U.S. and argue you're not redistributing enough. We should redistribute more. I'm saying it's, it's fine. But that's the difference you're on. It's fine to show up and argue for whatever you think is best. But to claim that you were coerced into doing it is where I have a problem with what you're saying. Sure. But, show up and say taxes are too high. But of course, it's coercion. It's it's nothing else but coercion. But hold on. You didn't have to come here. You didn't have to work. This is the fundamental point. I brought this last time. Yeah. The and, and by the way, I live in Puerto Rico for this reason, because I chose. You know, to reduce my taxes even further and I've reduced my taxes significantly by moving to Puerto Rico. So I, I am following this and I still can look at the United States from Puerto Rico. We kind of part of the United States, kind of not and say that's evil what they're doing. That's wrong. That's immoral. But look. I, I gave this example last time, and I think it holds for, for welfare and it holds for the issue of taxation. My neighbor can come and ask me for help, and I can voluntarily supply him help or not. It's up to me. Him getting together with all the neighbors and voting that I have to help him, that is coercion. And that is what democracy does. Democracy does not turn stealing into a virtue. It, stealing is stealing is stealing. It, the fact that a majority voted for it doesn't make it right. Now, you could say, I don't mind. I think that, that the fact that, you know, we steal is OK because there's some greater good achieved by it. Fine. But you have to acknowledge that it's stealing because it is the fact when if something is wrong for an individual to do, it's wrong for a group to do. The group doesn't make immorality go away. I don't think that we necessarily disagree about whether you have. 100 percent power, I guess is the way I would call it, to decide every aspect of what it's like to live in a country like I, I just hesitate to apply the words you're using because they have significant values, uh, judgments attached to them that are divorced from the empirical realities of being human and living in a group of more than 150 people. I think that's what maybe becomes frustrating about these arguments where OK, you you we've you might be I'm OK with the government saying if you want to live in this country and if you want to work, which they're not forcing me to do. Right. I mean, OK, I'm choosing if you want to do those things, then here is the way that it's going to work. And I can decide, well, on that basis, I will or will or won't work. But here's the, the okay. By what authority can they do that? So so I I mean, the whole the whole way in which particularly America was founded was on the principle of individual rights, not you start with the government. And then the government decides under what condition it's OK for you to live and under what conditions it's OK for you to work. No, the government, the, the, the U.S. This right. comes up often. The, the, the U.S. government's the U.S. The government's ability, the U.S. government's right to collect taxes is widely established and codified. If I you know, I'd have the citations in front of me had I known they were going to be necessary. I don't. But I've discussed this on my program. The idea that there is no legal basis for collecting taxes that that has been widely debunked. No, no I'm not going to argue that. OK, I'm not arguing that I'm arguing you believe it's illegitimate. The fundamental nature and I'm not even argue the history. I'm talking about the fundamental nature of government. OK, government is not there to dictate to me how to live my life. Government is there to serve the one function it's supposed to serve, which is to protect my life and property. And that is it. And everything okay. else that it does in the name of the social welfare 
is coercive. It is by its very nature forcing me to do things I don't want to do and thus violating my rights. It's an engagement of my right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, that that's your interpretation, and many people disagree. But I think our focus has been heavily on your disagreement with welfare on the basis of how it's paid for, because it's coming out of your taxes and you don't have a say. Let's for a second maybe shift to the other side of this, which is the issues of the function that welfare programs can have in a uh, in a society. Do you deny the negative externalities of economic despair that I mentioned during sort of my opening? Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to come out in favor of economic despair. Uh, you know, indeed, I believe that the that the, the, the correct way to deal with economic despair is to have, you know, a, a government that does not tax and redistribute wealth. I believe there's a lot more despair today in America than needs to be. Sure. I think people, pe- there t- way too many people today who are poor in this country. And I think if you unleashed the economic benefits of, of capitalism, of free markets, of a government that does not tax away my money that I would invest in productive activities, there would be many more jobs. The jobs would be much. And, and by the way, if we eliminated the regulations that we discussed last time, there would be many more jobs, much more economic activity. There's zero reason why the United States economy should be growing at what is it? One point nine percent right now. It should be growing at four to five percent at least at four to five percent growth. Poor people in this country, their standard of living would grow dramatically. But to achieve that, you would have to completely restructure the way we do things. We would actually have to establish a capitalist economy in this country, which we don't have. We have so this- yeah. But hold on, a couple things on four to five. So so number one, uh, four to five percent growth in any sustained way is extremely rare in countries that are as developed as is the United States. Usually, only countries that are not yet as developed can can experience that. But and I and you'll be able to comment on that. One sentence, one sentence. Yes. That's because there are no capitalist countries in the world. Okay. All right. I know that that's your perspective. The other thing, though, is there's a reality that if you had four or five percent growth, as we've seen, uh, 60, 70 or 80 percent of that growth would go only to the very top and it would do very little, actually, for the people in the in the bottom 80 or 90 percent. I mean, I don't want to get bogged down in the statistics, but that is unbelievably not true, plus <laughs> unbelievably not true. And you could read the Financial Times oh, the okay. critique of Piketty's book, and you can read all the other critiques of Piketty's book. I mean, what that man did with numbers, you know, is fraudulent, is, is basically <laughs> fraudulent. But and, and the same is true of the latest articles by his co-authors. I can't pronounce his name, S-A-E-Z, uh, and, and his, his, his co-author. Anyway, you live I, in I Puerto mean, Rico and you can't pronounce Saez? There's plenty in the economic literature, which I read, which is okay. a, a, a vast economic, not philosophical, not ideological critique of those studies and what what they do. And the whole the whole disengagement of productivity from labor costs is such. These are such wrong ideas that, again, are, 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 are repeated over and over again and become like institutionalized truths. When in the economic literature, they are all being challenged on a daily basis, not by ideologues, but by economists. So. I don't think that's true. But again, you're, you're, you're equivocating between two things. Um, you're equivocating between the world we have today and capitalism. We do not have capitalism today. There's no question that today a disproportionate amount of the wealth created goes to certain people at the expense of other people. Uh, a big reason for that is the way our Federal Reserve functions. That is, by pumping money into the financial system, drives up asset prices, mm. which most part benefit people who already have assets. And it doesn't benefit people who don't yet have assets. Uh, so there's no question that there is a distortion going on today. But that distortion is not driven by capitalism. It is driven by a very statist, I won't call it socialist, but statist institution, which is a Federal Reserve. I don't believe there should be a Federal Reserve. I, I, I believe in free markets, which means free markets in money and free markets in banking and, and unregulated uh, you know, issuance of currencies. So you know, to, to blame the problems that exist today in the United States on capitalism, it, it, it's just, it, it's it's not what capitalism is and it, it, it just, it's just not true. Well, listen, you're right that we, we, are, we of course don't have total unregulated free market capitalism. There are numerous Fox. markets where that's, of course we don't have that. But I think what's deceptive or maybe distorted, distortive about what you're saying is even if at the policy level you can say, 
The problem is the money that's pumped into the economy by the Fed. And there's lots of people like you who want to get rid of the Fed. The problem with that is the reason that we have those policies is because of the disproportionate influence over government of certain industries that benefit from those policies like banking and at so on and so forth. So while you want to hold on, hold on. So while you want to say the problem is that the government apparatus exists, really the problem, as I see it, is that the government apparatus has been uh, captured by certain industries, including the financial world and the financial sector. So I'll partially agree with you. OK, but your solution is the opposite of what the solution should be. Well, maybe. And the, and the, and the cause and effect is opposite. So I'll give you I'll give you a quick example, which, uh, you know, when uh, in, in 1995, let's say, when Microsoft was the largest corporation in the entire world and massive, how much money were they spending on lobbying, on trying to capture politicians? Well, zero, no lobbying, nothing, no lawyers, nobody in Washington, D.C., not a single person, no attempt to capture anything. And they were bought in front of Congress. And they were fought in, like, like uh, Zuckerberg has been recently, you know, in front of a panel. And Owen Hatch, a Republican senator from Utah, got up and started yelling at the Microsoft executives. You guys need to start spending money here. You guys need a lobby. You need to build a building. You need to get engaged. And Microsoft walked away from the meeting basically saying, you leave us alone. We'll leave you alone. We're not interested. We don't want to lobby. We have nothing to gain from you. We're the biggest company in the world, and we're doing a damn good job making money and, and improving the lives of billions of people around the planet. Six months later, knock on the door. We're here from the government, and we're here to... Um, you know, go uh, accuse you of antitrust violations. What was the what was the thing that Microsoft, God forbid, had done to screw our lives that justified a Justice Department investigation? They gave away a browser for free. Internet. Yeah, they were, the idea was that they were privileging their browser over all others and that it had, uh, you know, a destructive effect on competition because think of Netscape many, and whatever else. Think about how many browsers you have today all offered to you for free. So the argument was bogus, still is bogus. And yet they for 15 for 20 years, yeah. they had to deal with this 10 years in courts and 10 years with a government supervisor at Microsoft. Guess how much money they spent on lobbying today? I'm Hundreds guessing a lot, <laughs> a lot. So the lesson Microsoft learned was government will not leave you alone. The only way to get rid of lobbying, the only way and the only legitimate moral way to get rid of lobbying is to get rid of government power. Now, it, you know, you're on that there's a completely well, different interpretation least, of your Microsoft story. There's a different interpretation of the Microsoft story, which I'll present. And I don't know that it's the one I would die on a hill defending. But what the other interpretation of that would be that Microsoft at that early stage where they were making a ton of money and not doing any lobbying, the reason why they were able to do that is as often as the case government takes a while to figure out how to regulate new technology and new technology companies. And, and I know you're shaking your head, but let me at least get it out there because this is an argument that is it's not a crazy argument. I mean, we can discuss how, how valid it is. Yeah. And so what really happened there was once the government figured out, hey, here's how the regulatory infrastructure should be applied to this new industry. Microsoft was no longer floating under the radar and all of a sudden they did what everybody else has to do. That, that's the other interpretation. Of it. Sure. But either way, it leads to the same conclusion. Get government out of regulating business. Get uh, government out of the business of business because they're not shouldn't be in the business of coercing us or what products to buy, or how to buy them and what what information we need and so on. Then you don't have lobbying. So take take Google. Google uh, learned exactly following your case. It, it saw what happened to Microsoft and it said, uh oh, you know, government is regulating. So from day one, literally, you can go find this from day one. Google has been spreading the money around. Republicans, Democrats, everybody gets that's their right. Money. Indeed, and indeed, until recently, nobody in the United States has gone after Google. The Europeans have gone after Google because they didn't spread the money around there uh, in, in to the same proportion. They didn't bribe themselves out of regulation to the same proportion. And now people are starting to look at Google. Why? Because the regulatory apparatus now it's politically a good for both the left and the right to go after Google for different reasons. They both want to go after them. So, you know, yes, absolutely. There is a there's a there are whole mechanisms here, but the only solution to it is still right. I want to make politicians impotent when it comes to economics. And if that happens, then there's no incentive for me to lobby. The bigger the government becomes, the more powerful the government becomes, the more intruding the government becomes, the more regulations you have, 
the more lobbying you will have. There's a different p perspective as well, which is if you eliminate the money of lobbying and donations from PACs and so on and so forth, and you set up some term limits, you would free our elected officials because there's nothing on the other end. There's no consulting deal or whatever to just regulate the way that they believe would be best. And for many of them, that is regulation. There is regulation that many of them think would be best. The reason they're convinced out of it is because they need to raise money for that next reelection campaign. But, but you got You got a lot of problems there because you think you think, as most statists do, that you can come up with just the right statist. law. Statist. Well, you're a statist. I mean, you believe in a, in a big role for the state. I believe in a very minimal role for the state. I believe in a slightly bigger role for the state than than a, a centrist because I'm a social democrat. So to me, to me, everybody in the political the political spectrum today is a statist. OK, <laughs> so all of them. Every well, then it becomes no. an irrelevant term if everybody falls under that no, category. No, I mean, uh, you know, before there was freedom, everybody advocated for unfreedom, you could still advocate for freedom and try to convince everybody to move to your direction. So the fact that nobody agrees with me has no relevance to whether what I say is true or not. Okay. Uh, I mean, that's so true. If you, if you, if you think about, uh, if you think about it this way, why, why does, and I don't want to pick just on Hillary, think about, I, I just heard that because Hillary used to get $250,000 for a speech at Goldman Sachs. I, I know, um, uh, what's her name? Um, Haley, um, the, the former U.N. ambassador, uh, Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley is now getting six figures for speeches. Now, why do you think they get six figures for speeches? Because I know you don't get six figures and I know I don't get six figures. And I and I and I bet you both of us are both more interesting and better <laughs> speakers than they are. Right. Conne why? I mean, connections and the potential for future engagements. Right. I mean, exactly. yeah. Are you going to you're going to outlaw that? I mean, at what point do are you going to say the state is not going to cross anymore. I mean, I want to reduce coercion, not increase. I don't want more rules. I don't want to prevent people from using money to express themselves. I believe that is an expression of free speech. If I believe something is wrong, I should be able to shout it out from the, I should be able to buy, be able to buy billboards. I should be able to buy ads. I, you know, that's part of my speech. Is sure. But a, a company giving a company giving Nikki Haley money because she might in the future be involved in regulation that's not the government coercing anybody. Those are companies coercing Nikki Haley to eventually do what they want. Because Nikki Haley will have power over them one day and they expect to get favors back. So right. But if they can't give her the money, the starting point is, yeah, no, if, if you want to prevent companies from paying speaker fees for future politicians, because she's not running for anything right now. That's true. Clinton wasn't running for anything right now, you know, when she got the 250,000. Uh, you know, so you're going to have to have a whole system of coercion where you're telling people when they can't speak, when they can't speak, who can pay, who cannot pay. No, the, the easiest way to get rid of cronyism. And I'm a huge and, you know, talk about corporate welfare. First thing I'll get rid of if I were, you know, God forbid, president would be everything to do with corporate welfare, zero subsidies, zero uh, deductions from corporate taxes. I, I'd also lower corporate taxes to zero, but that's another issue. Zero. And then I would start lowering regulations. But the idea that, that the government should decide, you know, what they should, corporations, should, uh, who's they're allowed to pay and who they're not allowed to pay, who, what they can lobby, what they can't lobby, I think I think is unbelievably destructive and only leads to worse outcomes. Yeah, I'm, I'm against uh, getting so involved. I mean, I, you know, as, as a sort of left libertarian leaning uh, uh, progressive, I'm against telling companies you can or can't spend money in this way or that way. I mean, unless they're committing crimes by spending the money. Uh, you know, okay. But but I, I just um, I think that the framing of it really comes down to you said you chose a different starting point than I did. So depending on what we think is the catalyst that starts the circle, you end up finding a different solution. If you believe the starting point of the problem is the money versus the government, you're going to end up with a different prescription. To some extent, that's true. But but I but really, fundamentally, it's not. The fundamental here is it's the same with welfare. The fundamental here is coercion. Government should not have the power over corporations, whether the corporations lobby or not. Government should not be in a position to coerce corporations into what they can and cannot do. It shouldn't coerce individuals into what they can and cannot do with their money. It shouldn't be taking from some to give to others, regulating some. I just don't want people to be dependent on, I, I think it's immoral for, for a, a, an entity like government to be dictating our lives to us and telling us what we can and cannot do in every single realm. So Ayn Rand used to criticize the right 
and, and in those days, the right, I think, was, was was marginally better than it was much better than it is today. But that's because today it's so horrible. It, it, it's not because it was good then. She used to say the right kind of wants to leave you free in the boardroom, but wants to regulate you in the bedroom. And the left wants to re- leave you kind of free in the bedroom and to regulate you in the boardroom. I want to leave you free in every aspect of your life. Yeah, I, that's a talking point that's common. But it's like nor I think reasonable people would agree that there it is not equivalent to say that a government telling you that two men can't get married is the same thing as saying a government shouldn't be able to say we use taxation to fund schools like that to, to, to pretend that those are the same thing and I, bear I, the same relevance in society seems strange to me. Well, it seems to me that the issue of education is much, much worse than the issue of gay marriage. That is, I, I, again, I don't think the government should be involved in marriage. I don't think the government should be involved in education. Okay. But government involvement in education is a million times worse and more disastrous in its consequences than government involved in marriage. I mean, people could still live together, they could still have sex together, they could still cohabitate and so on. But if you take a poor kid and you inflict on him public education, and you do, Tim, what the public schools do to kids, <laughs> I don't think they can ever recover from that. And you know, here in Massachusetts, uh, here in Massachusetts, where schools are properly funded, public education's pretty good. You know, I went to, let me tell you, so since we're talking about childhood, I, I went to school in Massachusetts. I went to two schools in Massachusetts. I went to Brookline High School for one year. Great high and, school. And I went to a school before Brookline High School, which was considered the top up to eighth grade school in the country, one of the top. And Dukakis's kids went to the same school I did. This is in 75 and 76, 74 to through 76. And I, in two years in the Massachusetts public educational system, I fell basically two years behind oh, my come on. in Israel. No, I'm not kidding. In science and math, so not two years, I'm exaggerating for the rhetoric, rhetoric of flair. You were a two year, weeks behind, be, be honest. You missed I, one I, assignment. A year and a half. When I went to Brookline High School, I took 11th and 12th grade math and science courses in order to keep up with my Israeli counterparts. I'm not making this up, but no, the educational system, even in the places where we think it's good, yeah. is lousy. And the educational system for poor kids, by the way, Chicago spends a lot of money on poor kids, a lot of money, and educational outcomes are awful. Listen, I think that what you're describing, what you're describing about American kids being behind, I think it's true, but I don't think it's for the reasons you're saying. I think that in the United States, there is not currently a culture. I mean, it, the same thing happens in Argentina where we are t- teaching critical thinking from a young age. We are teaching kids to figure out why they believe what they believe. I think it's leading to way more people who are tricked into supporting Donald Trump as a result. I think it has political repercussions, but that, I think that this well, is a real problem. <laughs> Donald Trump will agree on, but uh, it, and, and it blaming the educational system for that. And I agree with you. Yeah. We're not teaching the right things, but I think that's what happens when you have a one size fit all system that is, and, and the more we centralize it, the worse it becomes instead of what I would like. Yes. Is I would like the next entrepreneur not to think about how to create the next stupid app for this, and Angry Birds 76. Right. But I would like the next entrepreneur to be thinking about how to build a school where they can educate, where they can teach, where they can make it affordable, where they can appeal to a large public. I would like to see real competitive and innovative markets where they matter. And I can't think of a realm more where it matters than education. Instead of having that dictated by uh, unions, by school unions, by teacher unions, I want to see competition. I want to see innovation. I want to see entrepreneurship. And I want to see the same motivation that goes into the next app, going into the next great educational product. And you don't get that as long as government not just funds education, but actually in a sense, controls the schools. All right. Well, we're not going to resolve it, but needless to say, my audience knows we are on, 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 in different positions on this. All right. This is a good point to, to pause our conversation. We've been speaking with Yaron Brook, chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute and host of the Yaron Brook Show. This has been episode three of our discussions, and the, there will be a fourth episode upcoming.